We're going to run back and just think about last week, barely, barely, uh, as a reminder of where we're coming from so we can get a running start into this week. Remember my friend Bob Stein? Made new, healed, brand new knees, right? Where did we find him? In the hospital bed, because it was so comfortable, because it was used to it by then. And, you know, he just, he could, he'd just hang out there and, and he even didn't even have to eat meals if he didn't want to because he kept the IV in. Then there was my friend Jason Hamill, who uh, inherited not only a restaurant, but a restaurant chain and a big house and everything else. But, you know, this is what he's used to and this is, he kind of feels like this is his thing. So you can find him there on the corner of one of the corners at Allentown when you look for him. Or Brad Snell. Cobra, you know, all kinds of power to spare. But you know what? If you, once you turn that key, it's a used engine, right? Plus, you know, this is how he'd push the car when he and his uncle had pushed it to the garage and he knew how to do it and wasn't sure about this driving with all that power. These people are living below their privilege, would you say? <laughs> They've got all this given to them, and now they're living as if it, they didn't have it. They don't have what they have. They don't possess what they possess. They haven't taken hold of it. Now, sometimes when you hear people talking about that, they are implying that God wants everybody rich and wealthy and happy and, you know, no hard stuff in their life. That's not the picture. But these people are living without what God has provided for them. And the last one is good old Liz Vaughn. She's just kind of average person, and she accepted the Lord. Remember that? And in fact, not only did she accept the Lord, but the Lord made her new. So, so revitalized and revamped her on the inside that you could call it being, could we say this? Born again. So different. Such a new nature that God put in her. She was an heiress to all that was in Christ. Wow, how's that? And she had power to spare because the Holy Spirit was in her, giving her what she needed to choose God's way. But she still had freedom not to choose God's way, and she doesn't, and didn't, often doesn't. And her life's a mess. She's all kinds of stuff in her life. You know, it happens to so many people. They think just over here they can kind of sneak something that God doesn't want them to have, but they really want. And over here they can sneak something that God wants them to have, and God, they may, you know, may have a little better time, or a little sweeter taste, or a little, you know, whatever it is. But you know what? That never, never, never works to take something God doesn't want for you and come out ahead. It's always a loss, every single time. And our life's a mess. People living without having what they have, without holding what they hold in the Lord. So we talked about being, to say, we're going to work out our salvation to what God has worked in, right? Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose he works in you and he's even helping you obey what he, the direction he gives you it's his power so what excuse do we have if we don't do what he says if we don't live the way he wants us to live now does that mean we're all perfect I think only a few of us are, I'm pretty sure. No, and, and I was careful to, to talk about this a little bit last Sunday because we want to be a fellowship where we know we're not perfect and we can, we, can, we can have our problems and we can lean on others when we need to, you know? Because we do need to. Who, who's desperate sometimes in here? Who doesn't want to admit it? Okay, <laughs> right? But. The Lord gives us his strength. He gives us his power. We can walk in victory. No, it's not going to get perfect till we get to heaven. But our lives ought to bring honor and glory to the Lord. They ought to be lives of, uh, that are shining for the Lord. That you read the first few chapters of first, well, read all the bad chapters of first John, but there the, the picture is so clear that we're if by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. The one who practices sin is of the devil. That's the one who practices righteousness of God, that's pretty straightforward. But then he also says, if we say we do not have sin, we're lying. Our lives ought to be sanctified, purified as we walk the way the Lord wants us to walk. And sure, we're going to still struggle with things. And we need each other sometimes on those. I mentioned some of those things. We, we need to reach out past ourselves sometimes for help with hard stuff in our lives. Okay. 
Now we're going to move on to this week. Coming back from last week to this week. Don't whine, shine. This is for you, Tony. <laughs> Anybody else have a problem with this? <laughs> you know, the scripture is full of do's of that's. Um, there are a lot of them in there. And you know what they are, right? Oh, somebody said, what's a do so that? I'm glad you said that. A do so that is like this. You do this so that this happens. And sometimes the do isn't the funnest part. It's the so that that's the funnest part. You know, like your parents said to you, eat, when you're very small, they said, eat your peas so you can have ice cream after dinner, right? <laughs> and then maybe later on they said, now this is going to date me really badly. I need a better example of this. Uh, someone said to you, deliver your papers every day so that you can collect the money from the people so you can buy your bicycle. Now, probably the last generation of paper boys right here, right? <laughs> but you know what it is. We, we say, do this so that this. Eat healthy so you can live well. Do, save money so you can retire. Save money so you can fix your refrigerator diet. You know, all those kind of things. Do this so that this. Got that? So everybody knows what a do so that is now. Do so that. Well, there's one here that is kind of surprising. It'll take you a little off guard. Do everything without complaining or arguing. That makes sense, right? I mean, we know it's, we're not surprised that God would say that. That's what I mean. But what's surprising is what it links up with, I think. At least it ought to challenge us and wake us up to something. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that... You may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. If we'll do this, it's going to have a consequence. If we do this, there's something that springs from it. If we do this, it causes something else to happen. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Let's talk about that for a minute. No, let's not. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Do everything without, and, and like it is kind of in English, the first two words are everything do in the Greek. So it's the, it emphasizes the everything in everything, which is too bad because I'm pretty willing to be without complaining except for the things that really need complaining about. Are you like that? I'm a pretty complaint-free guy. The only things I complain about are things that really need complaining about. <laughs> but the Lord has a different opinion. He says, in everything, do everything without complaining or arguing. By the way, this passage we're looking at today, and this is as far as I'm going to go, it's through the first part of verse 16. We read a little farther. Um, there's a whole bunch of words that, that Paul is taking out of the Old Testament, little mini phrases he's taking out of the Old Testament. They're very common, and he's going to kind of contrast some pictures that these people, if they're familiar with the Old Testament, would know. Some probably they're, they're not necessarily largely familiar with, but they, at least in Paul's mind, they're ready at hand. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, how, is that hard to understand? Oh, maybe, how could we make it hard to understand? Let's see. <laughs> I can't make it hard to understand. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, it could be that he means complaining or arguing against God or protesting against God. And I think it could be that he means uh, complaining or arguing against each other. It could mean complaining or arguing against the leaders in the church. And you'll find examples of all three of those things in Scripture with God's disapproval. And God's admonition to get rid of that. It's not what's supposed to be done. Now, well, let's go on. I think maybe I hear the church's theme song. <laughs> you know, I didn't mean to go ahead. I just skipped us. 
There we are. So the people, this is in, in the book of Exodus, so the people grumble against Moses saying, what are we to drink? In what kind of circumstances are these people? Anybody remember? They're in awful slavery in Egypt, have to get up and make mud bricks every day. Is that where they were? No, no, where are they? The wilderness. Not necessarily the most fun place, but they're there because why? Well, there's a couple of reasons, ways we could answer that, isn't there? But, they, but God has freed them. He's delivered them. He's brought them out. And what do they do mainly? Mainly they complain and protest and get angry. We had it so good back in Egypt. I wish, I, I bet Moses thought, man, I wish I had a tape recorder. You know, I wish I could go back and play that for the people in, in Egypt. We had it so good. Everything was great. We know everything was just, we had everything we needed. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Over and over and over and over in, in the Old Testament, you'll see this pattern. And it's not because these people were especially bad. It's because these people were people. And in us fallen humans, this is a natural thing to do because we want things the way we want them. And mostly, things aren't the way we want them. So the people complained. Well, after that, what happened is, the people complained. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Oh, I already read that. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. That's real gratitude for you, isn't it? We had it so good. If only we died back, that would be better than this. Or this. You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord, Moses said. Wow. Now here's a question for you. Hear those voices? Every so often you hear a little Moses brought up in there. Actually, you won't, but to pretend you would. Are they grumbling against the Lord? Are they? Moses said they were. The scripture says they were. They were grumbling against the Lord. Now, the, 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 the most appropriate application of that is for us to say, if you ever disagree with me, you're grumbling against the Lord. No, you're, you're, it's okay for to say, no, you're wrong, Pastor John. That's not the application here. Because I'm not coming with any particular inspiration from the Lord. I'll tell you if I think I am. And I hope that you, when you think I'm wrong and, and that you know how it should be, you'll come straight to me. You'll talk about it. We'll discuss it. Maybe I'll learn something from you or anybody, others, anybody else in this congregation with anybody else. We're accountable to each other. We can't do without that accountable, accountability to each other. I'm accountable to the body, right? So the point of this isn't, don't you ever disagree with me. What's the point of this? Don't grumble and complain off to the side, around the corner, to the people who aren't concerned. Don't go raise up the people on your side against the people on this side. Don't go talk to the people you know will agree with you and say, yeah, you're right. Go to talk to people you need to talk to and be positive and work for what's good. And when the Lord gives the direction, go with the direction. I'm not sure how to define all those careful lines in there. You know, we need all work on that, don't we? Do everything without complaining or arguing or protesting, as some, uh, as one translation says. Do not grumble against, you're not grumbling against us, says Moses, but against the Lord. You know, sometimes churches grumble about their pastors. And one reason, probably the strongest, well, there were two main reasons I didn't want to be a pastor when God wanted me to be. But one of the reasons was, I've been around a lot of complaining about the pastor. And my parents were godly people who loved the Lord. And it's because of them I'm a Christian more than anybody else. But they often, not, not real badly, but they would certainly complain about the pastor. You know? And, and what was the matter with him? What he was doing wrong? Why should his son do something else? You know, how he was whatever. And I, didn't, I, I knew too well what that sounded like in the other room. You know? And I didn't want to be the one that was subject to that. And 
people complain about their board members, their leaders. And you know when pastors get together, sometimes they complain about the congregations. And they complain about the crazy expectations that people have. And they groan with one another over what it's like to have 300 bosses, all with different ideas of what the job is like. And you know, all that kind of stuff. But the Lord says, quit it! That was a paraphrase. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Okay, I said that was pretty understandable, then I explained it a lot. Um, now, Tony and I were just catching up with where we're supposed to be. We're almost there. We're not quite there now, right, on our scripture reading? I mean, I'm pointing at her, not because it's her fault, it's mainly my fault. She's always saying, hey, John, we're behind, let's get this. Said, okay, yeah, we'll do this. <laughs> anyway, so in the car we were driving, we were listening to a whole bunch of scripture at a time, trying to get back to where we're supposed to be for our year through the Bible, you know? And uh, it's always a good thing to listen to big chunks at a time. And it was something to listen to this complaining, 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 complaining. It's complaining, God delivers them. Complaining, God takes care of them. God takes, you know. Then finally they complain so badly. You know, have you ever heard of Korah's rebellion? So Korah and his guys, 260 of them I think, said, this is enough. Moses, I don't know why you think you're in charge. God didn't make you any better than the rest of us. You're just a usurper. We don't like you. Get out of here. They didn't tell him to get out of here. He just said, we're not following you. He said, come here, let's talk. They sent it back. And I just said, no. Pretty straightforward. Um, so he said, okay, let's, uh, let's go and appeal to the Lord. You guys bring your censers full of incense, and I'll have Aaron bring his censer. And his, they also complain about Aaron as the high priest. I'll have Aaron bring his censer, and we'll all get together, and let's see what happens. So to make a long story short, they get together, and God sends fire out and burns those 260 people. And it wasn't like they didn't have warning. Moses had already talked to him, and then finally he said, everybody else get away from these guys. You don't want what's coming to them. And then he says, if these guys die a natural death, then you'll know that they're right. If they don't, oh, I forgot this. First, the earth opens up and swallows all these people, families and tents and everything, all these people who'd sided with Korah. And then I think if I remember right, the fire comes down. The fire burns up these 260 guys. That's after the plague that comes next. That's with putting all this together. So, you know, this God says, enough's enough. I can't work with this. He just wipes this out. He says, look, you guys are going to pass on this DNA for generations and generations. And I'm talking about spiritual DNA, not physical. For generations and generations, we cannot have this. So he wipes them out. And then I have to read you what the next verse is. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You've killed the Lord's people. Can you believe that? Why? They're grumbling against Moses there and Aaron after they saw all these people die yesterday. I'm not sure what that was. Anyway, somebody had a trumpet that played after they grumbled, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, right after they've seen God's judgment on this, they're grumbling that God judged them. I just can't believe it. So God says, I'm just going to wipe them all out. Moses and Aaron fall on their faces, pray to the Lord, ask for deliverance. Says, Don't wipe them all out just for some people's sin. You know, this is the second time they've done that right in a two-day period. And he says, and, and God sends in a plague and, and, and many, many people start dying. Moses runs out there with his censor and his incense and intercedes with the Lord and the Lord stops it. And only 14,000 people die on that day. Wow. Do you think God is serious about this? Wow. Which of us need this admonition? Well, probably all of us. Somebody said this is the last thing that sticks to Christians. I'm, you know, a sin. I don't, I'm not sure that's true, but it's sure one of the last that, that is, is tough to get rid of. Scripture says, do not do everything without complaining or arguing. That's the do. And now let's take a little bit of a look at the so that. So that you may become blameless and pure. 
Now he's talked about blameless and pure in our earlier in chapter in the chapter one before this. There's actually different words used, even though it's a similar idea. God is wanting to move us toward the place where there's nobody can say anything against us, and we are really do honor the Lord in our lives, where there's no accusation that will stick. And pure. And let me tell you, in this case, pure can mean different things. In this case, it means all one thing. And I'll give you a picture of what it's like, because the other day I was going to make a vanilla shake for Tony, and we have this way of making shakes, you know, with no ice cream for so fewer points and Weight Watchers. And, and um, so we, you know, put in the powdered milk and the vanilla and the, some sugar and start adding the ice and it looked really good. And I served it to Tony. I forgot, though, that the day before I put, uh, starting something I never finished, I put in two tablespoons of that really strong horseradish, you know? And uh, so, I, just before I gave it to Tony, actually, I thought, oh, you know what? There was still that horseradish in there. I did quick mental calculations, and I thought, okay, two tablespoons out of two quarts. But that, that is still 96% pure. Who's going to complain about that? How about that? It's 96% pure. That's pretty good, isn't it? 96% pure can be terrible. <laughs> And the Lord wants us to be pure, not 96% pure, but all God's direction. God wants us to be all His direction, all about Him. And, and what we do, you know, the, when we have a day off, we enjoy our day off in the Lord. When we're going to work, we honor the Lord's name and work hard to, to do all that we can for the success of our boss and for everything else. And when we go to school, we study so that God can make his most, most out of us so that he can. We choose these choices because we want to honor the Lord. We want to be all about God, all his direction, all in for his name and for his glory. We want to do everything we do for the glory glory of God. Pure that way. 100% one thing. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Now, I wish this applied to us, but you know, in Paul's day, the generation those people lived in really wasn't very godly. Whereas in our day, everybody around us is pretty much perfect. No, this applies pretty nicely to us, doesn't it? Um, we live in a generation that is throwing out God's um, uh, directions and has, has, has made man the measure of everything and whatever I want is the final standard and whatever I deserve is what I should have. And by the way, if you want to know what you should deserve, just look at any ad, you deserve everything. Ask any ad, you deserve it. You know, it's, maybe it started with you deserve a break today, I'm not sure. But now you deserve everything. You deserve this. You deserve that. You deserve that. Do you really? <laughs> anyway, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, you ought to stick out like a non-sore thumb, a non-crooked thumb, you know, in the middle of this generation. Children of God that, that no accusation can stick to, without fault. In which you shine, in which, in, in that generation, in the midst of that generation, you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And by the way, this is, the way this is written, um, the hold out, you could also translate hold tightly to. Um, and uh, there's some translations that do it one way, some translations the other way. I, I, I think I would prefer, I would side with the folks that translate this way and the commentators that say this makes the better contextual sense. You shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Now this idea of shining with something and of demonstrating God's truth and showing who God is by our actions and by the way we live and by our words is all over scripture. It's there a lot. We could read about it in uh, 1 Peter 2, 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll say, you guys are, you, you, you. though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They'll say, wow. I'm not sure, you know, I, he seems like a weird religious person to me, but he sure is a nice person to have in the office. 
she sure is a nice person to hang out with as a, as a fellow mom. She, you know, good. I'm glad that student is my friend. In Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, that might sound like a contradiction to where he says, don't do your good deeds before men. He's, but it's not a contradiction. They're saying the same thing. He says, don't do them to show off who you are, but do do them to show off who God is. Let your light shine before men. Hold out that word of life. Shine like a star in the universe in that crooked, depraved generation. That you may see, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. How does this work? Well, we'd already read in Philippians, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man, shoulder to shoulder, as sword brothers and sisters, for the gospel, for the faith of the gospel. The scripture says that, that people should not even be able to make any accusation against you, stick. God, they should be able to tell something, something special about you. Do everything without complaining or arguing. I'm going to summarize that this way. Don't whine. Don't whine. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation with this result, and, and in this way, in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you demonstrate the life of God in your changed life and new nature and spirit-empowered choices, in which you shine like stars in the universe, universe as you hold out the word of life. And I'm going to summarize all that in this way. Shine. Don't whine. Shine. I saw a t-shirt like that years ago at Roxbury Camp. I thought, I like that. Don't whine. Shine. The, need, the world needs more shining and less whining. And especially if we're saying we serve the Lord. Now, as a memory aid, I, I'm so glad for this, a foreign, a na one of the European nations made a great statue um, celebrating this whole idea and memorializing it. You probably recognize this face, right? Um, this august personage. Or maybe you don't recognize it, we'll put her in context and then maybe you'll start recognizing her more. This is the Philippians 2, 14 through 16 statue. Right? Wait. Somebody said Statue of Liberty. I don't know where you got that. I am now officially, formally repurposing the statue. Don't go and say I'm not for liberty, okay? <laughs> Every time you see the statue, you ought to think about this at God's. See, and you can tell because she's holding the Bible. She wants to hold out the word of life to people. See that, that, that torch there? So that everybody can see it. Watch this. And you want to see what it looks like lived out? You can watch me. You want to see somebody that will love back when I'm not loved? You want to see somebody that will stay true when it would be to my benefit seemingly not to? You want to see somebody you can trust not to talk about you behind your back? You want to see somebody? Well, watch this. Because Jesus is in me. And the Holy Spirit gives me the power I need to make the choices that honor Him. Don't whine. Shine. Now to be fair, we have to say, what if this gets turned around? What if we say, whine? Well, I wish it was hypothetical. <laughs> but it's not always, is it? And when we whine, it's not a pretty thing. We don't like to look at it. We don't like to hear it. But think about what we're saying. <coughs> um, think about what we're saying. We're saying to the world, basically, wow, I was lost, I was messed up, but God has rescued me. And now God has given me everything I need and enables me to live every day with his victory and he is all I need and he is my joy. And man, what a pain it is. What do you think? Is that effective? And boy, is it a drag. 
we complain, we complain. And think about the stuff we complain about. You know, if you've been around the world any, compare what we complain about. Oh man, I had to, I had to have a, I used a shower and the hot water ran out. Us Americans, we have it so hard, don't we? Stuff we have to live with, it's just hard. Man, don't whine. And if we do whine, man, we won't shine. You can just turn off that light. In fact, it's not just we won't shine, we de-shine. I already mentioned this, but I have to mention it again. When you're talking to people about the Lord and they have objections to what Jesus has done, in my experience, whatever it's worth, about four out of five times, their objection isn't some philosophical thing about the problem of evil or something about how we fit evolution in this or don't or any of that. The, the, about four out of five times their problem is, well, my aunt said she was a Christian. You should have seen the way she treated me. Or my parents used to go to church and that church just did such and such to them. Or, you know, when I was at church, all the people were gossiping behind each other's back or, you know, whatever. That's what puts, that's what blocks what God is doing so often. So often. Don't whine. Shine. Could it be that God is still God even if our lives aren't just the way we want them? So is, does God have a right to call us to walk a path with some difficulty in it? How about some real hard stuff? Have you ever noticed that some of God's favorite people, it seems like, have some of the hardest paths? Sure, for me, as I look around me, it seems like that's often the case. The people that are closest to the Lord sometimes have the hardest things to go through. What would it be like to be called to a path so hard and yet say, okay, Lord, your will be done. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? You know, when Jesus came here, he didn't just give up his life for us. He gave his life for us. Every day, every hour, his whole life was all about us. And then he did give up his life for us in his death. He sacrificed himself, not just to show us how much God loves us, although he certainly did, but as a transaction to say, my life is forfeit to pay for where your life is required. So your sin can be forgiven. Your sin and its penalty are credited to my account. My life is credited to your account. If you'll put your faith and trust in me, Wow, it's that simple.